Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the second episode of Karadas Ramadan edition. Special lunch hour. This is your sister, Lara Abu Ghanam, and I'm the Central Florida Regional Coordinator with Care Florida. Before we begin, I want to pay my respects to George Floyd and share in the relief with his family, inshallah. I do want to thank Allah for the accountability of his murder, and I pray to Allah that justice is served for our black brothers and sisters and all minority communities in ways of true systemic change, ending racism, oppression, and brutality in all forms. Allahumma amin ya. So our program today is First Amendment, except for Palestine, where we'll be discussing the unconstitutional bills that revoke our right to freedom of speech and freedom of protest when it comes to advocating for Palestinian human rights and justice for decades of military occupation. I am so honored to be joined today by three incredible experts and powerhouses when it comes to Palestinian advocacy. We are joined by Omar Barghouti, a Palestinian human rights defender and co-founder of the Palestinian-led Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement for Palestinian Rights. He is the co-recipient of the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award and also, also the author of BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. His views have appeared in numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, CNN, among so many others. And we have Mr. Alan Levine. He's a civil rights lawyer and a member of South Florida's Jewish Voice for Peace. Alan has been a longtime civil rights and constitutional lawyer. He works in partnership with Palestine Legal and the Center for Constitutional Rights, and he has represented advocates for Palestinian rights in courts and on campuses, most recently students trying to create a Students for Justice Club at Fordham University. Also joining us is Dr. Rabab Abdelhadi. She's a professor of ethnic studies, race and resistance at San Francisco State University and the director of Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diaspora studies program, of which she's also the founder and the senior scholar. She's the recipient of several highly competitive and prestigious awards, including the Sterling Fellowship by Yale and Courage Awards by Al Auda and American Muslims for Palestine. She holds many exceptional positions, including serving on the International Advisory Board of World Congress of Middle East Studies. She's currently writing about critical oral histories of Palestinian activism and editing an anthology project that calls for decolonizing of the curriculum and ending the erasure of Palestine through education. It is a pleasure to be hosting you all. Thank you for being here, and I am very excited to learn from you today. So today we will be covering the legislation that strips us of, the, of our rights, the movement that is attacked by these laws, and the lobbying efforts that get these laws in place. In Florida, we currently have four active bills, two targeting specifically boycotts, and then what I call the catch-all bill, a bill silencing any Palestine advocacy, which happened to pass unanimously, including vocal support by self-proclaimed progressives here in Florida. Alan. Can you elaborate on these bills and the impacts they have on us and our rights? Uh, sure, Lauren. Thanks so much for um, having me on this panel. Such distinguished guests. It's a great honor. Um, so, some background first. Um, our governor, Ron DeSantis, holds himself out as uh, the United States' most pro Israel governor, and he's uh, bent on making Florida uh, the most pro-Israel state, which means that uh, satisfy Israel's supporters. He is pushing, has pushed successfully uh, for legislation that restricts advocacy for Palestinian rights. The laws that you're talking about are political, uh, politically inspired. They, they have little um, legal effect. They're certainly not warranted by any uh, legal need, but they serve uh, the political purpose that Governor DeSantis wants. Um, the, first, the first set of laws dealing with boycotts um, are uh, what they limit is the right of uh, companies that boycott Israel to contract with uh, state agencies. Uh, the fact is there are very few such uh, companies in Florida, so the law is mostly symbolic. 
uh, and it's why there are some 30 such laws around the country. Uh, it's not that their, their application to companies, as I said, is so significant. It, ser <clears throat> it serves the purpose of delegitimizing BDS, uh, and that's its political purpose. They have been attacked on constitutional grounds in, in uh, several states. Four courts have found them to be unconstitutional. My sense is that Florida's would, would be uh, found to be unconstitutional as well. The more serious bill, uh, though also motivated by politics, is the anti-Semitism legislation. And there are two laws that, that um, fall into this category. <clears throat> They're modeled after, <clears throat> forgive me, what's known as the IRA definition, a definition of anti-Semitism created by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. It was a working definition, but it has been enacted into law in, in a number of countries um, and municipalities around the world, including in the United States. Though the only state to uh, enact the IRA definition into law is, is Florida. Um, it, DeSantis is tuned into something very important. He, noted, he, he, he knows the significance of the charge of anti-Semitism. Um, and so a law that labels one anti-Semitic for violating it is of course going to deter people from wanting to violate it. Two of the sections of Florida's law define anti-Semitism in terms of criticism of Israel. One says that it is anti-Semitic to a double standard to Israel that is not applied to other democratic uh, nations. And the other says uh, it's anti-Semitic to delegitimize Israel by denying the Jewish people the right to their own state. So under that law, uh, it's reasonable to uh, be afraid of being charged with anti-Semitism if you criticize uh, Israel's human rights record without saying at the same time that other states' human rights record is equally bad. Um, one perhaps runs afoul of that law if one advocates for a single democratic state in which all persons have equal rights and Jews do not have a privileged status in, in Palestine. So it is, um, it is actually a serious uh, restraint on free speech. Um, and it's thoroughly unnecessary. There is, of course, a resurgence of anti-Semitism, as there's a resurgence of racism and Islamophobia and misogyny and transphobia. But definitions don't help in that fight. Um, the, the major international covenant dealing with the protection of, of religion simply says that it shall be subject no one shall be subject to coercion which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. Um, the U.S. Civil Rights Law of 1964 says simply it is unlawful to, to discriminate because such individuals, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. There are no definitions in any of those laws. They all are effective in prohibiting discrimination. The definition of anti-Semitism is simply a political tool to silence dissent about, uh, about uh, Palestine. Because of its obvious free speech impl implications, it's been opposed by the American Civil Liberties Union and other civil rights organizations in this country and abroad. A group of Canadian academics in response to a proposal that Canada adopt the IHRA said as follows. If adopted, the IRA definition, definition will place Canadian academics 
especially those conducting anti-racist and decolonial scholarship at great risk of being falsely accused of being anti-Semitic, which could result in intimidation, censorship, job precarity, and costly litigation. It's, it's a suffocating effect on uh, Palestinian advocacy and teaching uh, is, is obvious. Uh, here in Florida, we have a student who has told us about a professor at Florida State University teaching a course on the Middle East who said uh, after he got to 1948 in Palestine, he said, I have to stop here because there is a real possibility of me running afoul of this law. Um, it's not only silencing um, uh, Palestinian advocacy and the struggle for Palestinian justice, um, but we're all familiar with the term of intersectionality, the important concept for social justice activists to understand the interconnected sources of racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. Um, but it's also important to note that there are intersectional consequences. Here in Florida, um, DeSantis ran against a man named Andrew Gillum. And uh, part of his appeal was that Gillum was not sufficiently uh, pro-Israel, that um, uh, there were hints that he was not uh, that he might support uh, Palestinian rights. Uh, another state Senate candidate, Dwight Bullard, actually went to Palestine, Dream Defense trip, and um, most observers would say that that trip uh, essentially cost him uh, his, his re-election. Um, the power of the charge of anti-Semitism is an intimidating one. Um, HB 741, the anti-Semitism law, passed unanimously without a single dissent, notwithstanding its obvious problems of constitutionality. One legislator said, well, if we're going to define uh, anti-Semitism, why don't we define Islamophobia? And she was, she was highly criticized by defenders of the law as being anti-Semitic, not sufficiently concerned with anti-Semitism. And so she withdrew that amendment. And as I said, uh, the, the law passed unanimously. Um, Governor DeSantis signed it not only in the State House, but he signed it in Jerusalem. Uh, so he knows well uh, what he's doing with these laws. And, and people who want to speak out uh, in public colleges to which the anti-Semitism law applies also know well what the possible consequences are of running afoul of that law. Um, I think I'll stop there and leave it to others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Dr. Abdelhadi, did you have anything to add to this? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And I want to acknowledge that San Francisco State sits on unceded indigenous people's land. And thank you for mentioning justice for George Floyd and everybody who has been a victim of racial violence, whether here in Palestine or anywhere around the world. Uh, I do want to add, thank you, Alan. I do want to add uh, to uh, a couple of issues. One of the things that uh, I have been personally um, accused of, as well as many of my colleagues, as students and the whole movement is uh, anti-Semitism. And part of the reason I believe that is uh, being propagated by Israel and its supporters in order to conflate the uh, Jewishness, Israel, Zionism, and Judaism together. And that's actually quite problematic, not only intellectually for our research, but also for fighting against real anti-Semitism. We know that Zionism was only one recipe for how to fight against anti-Semitism. There have been historically many ways to confront anti-Semitism. I'm talking about people who are against anti-Semitism as racism and, and form of racial justice, as against all forms of racism and racial, uh, racial justice. 
But Zionism came in and said, this is the way we are, we're, we're, we want to build it. We want to be able to build uh, 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 what became Israel. And it, that those goals have coincided also with the goals of the anti-Semitic colonial powers in Europe who wanted to get rid of Jews among them. So this is, this is the history is actually quite sordid and quite problematic. For today, when Zionists say, and with pro-Israel supporters and apologists say, that Jews, Zionism, Israel, and Judaism are all the same. It's also really problematic because you're applying a monolithic definition to Jews across time and place. To say that Jews everywhere, from time immemorial until today, are the same is quite problematic and falls exactly into the hand of anti-Semite and other races. That's one thing. Secondly, to accuse us and say that we are anti-Semitic because we're criticizing Israel, it means that singling out Israel as one country from being uh, accountable for uh, everything else that it does like any other countries. And I think I like what you're talking about, the exception, i.e. making Israel an exception and allowing Israel to get away with not only practically murder, with murder as well. And I think also it's really problematic because it does, as Alan was saying, uh, try to attempt to divide and rule and say that one aspect of uh, hatred, one aspect of racism is separate from other aspects of racism which makes it really difficult for us to apply the indivisibility of justice and to band together, to come together to organize with each other. The last thing I would say is that it's very interesting for DeSantis to actually be claiming to be standing for morality and human rights. When he was one of the people who contested the results of the elections, he's very much implicated with the people who went on, on January 6th to Washington DC and almost conducted a coup d'etat. And I should say, by the way, there were a lot of supporters of Israel carrying Israeli flags there. So we might want to ask, where is the parallels and where is the connection with that? And I'll stop and I can say some later. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdel Hadi. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Hadi and Alan. I always enjoy learning from you both. Um, Alan, I also watched JV, uh, excuse me, uh, South Florida JVP's brilliant program last night on this topic. So thank you so much for putting that on. Um, please, if you're interested, you can follow JVP's work at facebook.com backslash JVP South Florida. So why do we have these laws in place focused on silencing Palestinian advocacy specifically? It's because of BDS, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement. This movement was inspired by the apartheid movement in South Africa, and it calls for nonviolent action by the international community to put pressure on Israel to end its military occupation, human rights violations, and the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. So Omar, I'd like to get into your most recent essay, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, Globalized Palestinian Resistance to Israel's Settler Colonialism and Apartheid. So what's the strategy of BDS? Who are the targets? And what has been the global response to this movement? Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lara, for having me. And, and Kara, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, yes, BDS has become a real headache for Israel's regime, and I'll explain why. Israel's full enlistment, enlistment of Washington, whether in the Trump era or currently in the Biden administration era, in its war on the BDS movement for Palestinian rights, is perhaps the strongest indicator yet of the movement's impact on Israel's regime of military occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid, and Israel's failure to crush the movement. But how did BDS, a nonviolent movement, become such a strategic challenge to Israel, a country with immense military power, including nuclear arsenal, economic strength sustained mainly by your tax money, billions of dollars in military funding from the US, and decades-long impunity for its egregious violations of international law. Representing the overwhelming majority of Palestinians in historic Palestine, as well as in the diaspora, the broadest Palestinian coalition in history came together in 2005 and launched BDS, calling for three basic rights under international law, ending Israel's 1967 occupation, dismantling Israel's institutionalized, legalized system of racial domination and segregation, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and upholding the internationally recognized right of Palestinian refugees to return to the homes and lands from which they were uprooted during the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of 1947-1948. It's worth mentioning that Israel's most prominent human rights organization, Beth Salem, has recently joined many Palestinian and international organizations 
in condemning Israel's regime against all Palestinians as, quote, a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, an apartheid regime. The three BDS demands correspond to the three main constituencies of the Palestinian people. Some 38% of Palestinians live in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. 12% are Palestinian citizens of present-day Israel, and a whole 50% are Palestinian uh, uh, exilic communities, including mostly refugees. Anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the BDS movement has consistently opposed all forms of sexism, racism, discrimination, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous discrimination, and so on. One's identity, the movement upholds, should never diminish or restrict one's entitlement to rights. BDS, as a result, targets complicity, not identity. BDS is deeply rooted in decades of Palestinian popular uh, uh, nonviolent resistance, as well as in the South African anti-apartheid movement, and it's very inspired by the U.S. civil rights movement, and to an extent, the Indian and Irish anti-colonial struggles. In a Global South response to a unified Palestinian call for lawful targeted sanctions to stop Israel's apartheid regime and its planned annexations, 10 former presidents from Latin America and South Africa endorsed our demands for sanctions. So did hundreds of parliamentarians, academics, artists, civil society leaders from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and increasingly in the global north as well. The parliaments of Chile, Belgium, and the Netherlands have threatened Israel with sanctions if it went ahead with its annexation. Even in the US, 12 Senate Democrats have introduced legislation that would prohibit Israel from using US military funding to annex portions of the occupied West Bank. Such measures by governments and political figures partially explain why Israel's extremist government and its allies have intensified their war on BDS, which Israel has designated as a strategic threat to its regime of oppression since 2013. The impact of BDS campaigning at the municipal and political levels worldwide has figured prominently in an authoritative Israeli anti-BDS report that bemoaned the movement's increased sophistication and admitted that Israel has, quote, largely failed to disrupt the BDS momentum. Still, BDS faces an uphill battle against an Israeli regime that is more fanatical than ever, more violent than ever. Israel is escalating its medieval siege of 2 million Palestinians in Gaza, its incessant destruction of Palestinian homes and olive groves, its gradual ethnic cleansing of indigenous Palestinian communities in Jerusalem, the Jordan Valley, and the Naqab, the Negev, its relentless theft of Palestinian land, and its wanton murder and imprisonment of scores of Palestinian men, women, and even children. Israel is enjoying a disturbing level of impunity thanks to blind support from its anti-Palestinian and or far-right allies in the US, Europe, India, Latin America, and increasingly some autocratic, despotic Arab regimes. With all this, Israel projects an unprecedentedly powerful and invincible image, partly to colonize our minds with despair. Consequently, the struggle for Palestinian liberation has always been conditioned upon decolonizing Palestinian minds from deeply seated powerlessness and hopelessness and embarking on a praxis, as Paulo Freire calls it, a radical process of hopeful globalized resistance, transformation, and emancipation. Despite decades of ruthless Israeli ethnic cleansing and settler colonial brutality, enabled mostly by the West, the Palestinian people have not given up. We continue to resist oppression and to assert our quest for emancipation, self-determination, and equal rights to all peoples. But what about BDS impact? Effective BDS campaigns have compelled major companies like Veolia, Orange, CRH, and others to end their involvement in illegal Israeli projects that violate Palestinian rights. The world's largest security firm, firm G4S, has suffered what the Financial Times described as reputational damage due to BDS campaigning. 
It withdrew from many of its projects in Israel, but it continues to be complicit in training Israel's police with all their brutality. So it remains a target for BDS campaigns. Hewlett Packard, HP branded companies were compelled under sustained BDS pressure to end most of their illegal projects in Israel as well, but they continue to be complicit and therefore they're on our boycott and investment targets. Sovereign funds in Norway, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and elsewhere have divested from Israeli and or international companies involved in Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. Mainstream churches in South Africa have endorsed BDS, while major churches in the US, including the Presbyterian Church, United Methodist Church, United Church of Christ, and others have divested from US companies and or Israeli banks for their involvement in those violations. The city of Dublin in Ireland in 2018 became the first European capital to adopt BDS, while tens of other cities and hundreds of cultural institutions and public spaces across Europe, especially in Spain and Italy, have declared themselves Israeli apartheid free zones. BDS has broadened its base of support by winning the endorsement of major international trade union federations in South Africa, Latin America, India, Europe, Canada, and even the United States. On tens of campuses in the US, Canada, the UK, and elsewhere, broad progressive intersectional coalitions led by Students for Justice in Palestine and many other solidarity groups have succeeded in passing BDS resolutions with overwhelming majorities. Alan mentioned uh, intersectionality, a concept that was developed by black feminists in the United States and that has be become an indispensable component of effective justice struggles by oppressed communities worldwide. Based on its inclusive and progressive principles, the BDS movement has established and nourished bonds of mutual solidarity with movements defending the rights of refugees, immigrants, blacks, women, workers, indigenous nations, LGBTQI communities, and ethnic and religious minorities. A growing number of anti-colonial Jewish, Jewish Israeli BDS supporters play a significant role in exposing Israel's regime and calling for boycotting it. The Palestinian BDS National Committee, the largest coalition Palestinian society that's leading the global BDS movement, was among the first to stand in solidarity with the Standing Rock Seal tribe in its struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline project. In May 2020, the BNC issued a statement in solidarity with the Black-led uprisings for justice following the murder of George Floyd in police custody. It endorsed Black Lives Matter's fight against white supremacy and its demands for reparations and ending systemic racism. In response to this impressive growth of support for Palestinian rights in recent years, including in the US, Israel has since 2014 waged a global war on the BDS movement, including extensive propaganda, legal warfare, and espionage. In 2016, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is the anti-BDS ministry in Israel's government, established a tarnishing unit, and that's the official name, a tarnishing unit to smear Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights defenders in the BDS movement. An Israeli minister has publicly threatened BDS activists, myself included, with targeted civil assassination, drawing condemnation from Amnesty International. Over the last decade, as was mentioned, Israel has become a role model for far-right, xenophobic, and authoritarian leaders across the world, and not just Trump, even Modi and Bolsonaro and, and Orban and, and, and many others. In the US, Israel and its lobby groups, including fundamentalist Christian Zionist groups, have succeeded in passing anti-BDS legislation and statements in some 32 states and counting, as well as in Congress, prompting the ACLU to condemn such leg legislation as unconstitutional and reminiscent of McCarthy-era tactics. Several federal courts have already frozen anti-BDS legislation in Kansas, Texas, Arizona, and Arkansas, citing their incompatibility with the US Constitution, especially the free speech amendment. CARE, of course, has been one of the key organizations defending free speech on Palestine, along with Palestine Legal, CCR, National Lawyers Guild, and of course, ACLU. While Israel celebrates its enormous influence in the US, at the political level at least, it's missing the growing undercurrent of resentment and apprehension that these McCarthyite tactics are creating. 
A University of Maryland poll published in 2020, for instance, revealed that 72% of all Americans, 80% of Democrats, were opposed to anti-BDS laws because they infringe on, infringe on freedom of speech. An earlier poll in 2018 by the University of Maryland as well showed that 40% of Americans, 56% of Democrats, support imposing sanctions or more serious measures on Israel to stop its expansion of settlements. Imagine a 56% of Democrats. <clears throat> Progressive Jewish groups led by uh, Jewish Voice for Peace in the US have played an important role in this overall shift in US public opinion, including a dramatic flux in liberal Jewish Americans' views of Israel, particularly among the younger generation. According to an extensive survey by the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, a right-wing Israel lobby group, up to 25% of liberal Jewish Americans are, quote, intensely critical of Israel and Zionism itself, including attitudes that Zionism may be a colonial and or racist apartheid movement as practiced in Israel today, end of quote. Another survey conducted by J Street uh, in November 2020 shows that 22% of Jewish Americans under the age of 40 support a full boycott of Israel. In light of the Israeli lawfare against BDS, Israel and its lobby groups have aggressively promoted the revisionist definition of anti-Semitism that Alan spoke about to shield Israel from accountability to human rights and international law. But claiming that boycotting Israel is intrinsically anti-Semitic is not only baseless propaganda. It absurdly, as, as Dr. Abdel Hadi says, it absurdly equates Israel with all Jews. This is as bigoted as claiming that boycotting a self-defined Islamic state like Saudi Arabia, say, over its legalized discrimination against women or its war crimes in Yemen is tantamount to being Islamophobic. What nonsense. Since there is nothing Jewish about Israel's regime of occupation, siege, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid, there is nothing inherently anti-Jewish then about a nonviolent, morally consistent human rights struggle to end this entire system of oppression. So to end, at a minimum, solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle today entails pressuring the US government to heed Amnesty International's call to stop military funding to the Israeli government, which amounts to some 3.8 to $4.5 billion of your tax money per year. It includes campaigning in city councils, churches, universities, among others, to adopt ethical procurement and investment guidelines that ban companies implicated in all human rights violations against blacks, against women, against LGBT communities, and certainly against Palestinians. But why should an average person in the West today stand in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for rights at a time when your own country may be suffering from increased unemployment, poverty, racism, uh, deteriorating healthcare, education, infrastructure, especially given the COVID-19 crisis. Well, oppressors are more united than ever, and oppressions have never been more intersectional. It is high time to explore the mutuality of contemporary globalized resistances. Divided, we fail. United, we prevail. Or at least, we maximize our chances of success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, that was amazing. Um, Alan, I, I, did you want to say a couple of words? Both Dr. Abdul, Abdul Hadi and, and Omar Bardgudi um, talked about the equation between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, it's a very effective tool used to silence Palestinian advocacy. Um, and as both pointed out, um, lots of Jews, myself and all of Jewish Voice for Peace and hundreds of thousands of other American Jews uh, oppose what Israel is doing, uh, notwithstanding uh, being Jewish. Um, the other thing uh, in, in what Omar talked about uh, touches on the, the anti-boycott bills and I, what Omar said, it, described as the enormous power of the BDS movement 
And so I want to make it clear when I said these anti-boycott laws are more symbolic than real. That is, there are not so many companies that are boycotting Israel that would be affected by these anti-boycott laws. But symbols are important. Symbols have an enormous impact. And um, to delegitimize the BDS movement through these anti-boycott laws conveys a message uh, that can be powerful. Um, the right to boycott is protected by the First Amendment. Four courts have said so, and I'm confident that they will continue to say so. Um, and these laws are, are an important obstacle to uh, advocacy for BDS and can be and will be challenged. Thanks. Thank you, Alan, Ben, and Omar for educating us on this extremely important movement and form of resistance. Uh, you know, may Allah continue to make it successful regardless of any obstacles they try to throw our way. I mean, um, as Alan had educated us, the latest attack on Palestine advocacy came in the form of legislation conflating criticism of Israel's human rights violations with anti-Semitism. As we know, the two are not at all the same. Then how did we get this law? How can a foreign government be insured more protections in this country than the U.S. government itself? The answer is political lobbying. So, Dr. Abdel Hadi, can you please explain what the Zionist lobby is and how it works? Yes, thank you. Uh, I will. Uh, I, I want to. I don't want to add uh, more to what already Omar and Al uh, Omar Barghouti and Al Levine have said. So, I'm going to just build upon that. So, the Israel lobby is uh, in, in my definition, we, we actually say Israel lobby industry because it includes the registered, former registered lobby, which is APAC, American uh, Israel Anti-Public Anti Affairs Committee, as well as multiple, and there are lobbies that are registered, but they are not as big as uh, APAC. But then there is also multiple organizations that are very well funded, that are very well supported by Zionist uh, right-wingers as well as Christian Zionists. That this is the funding, for example, by the late uh, Adelson, who had just passed away, uh, Sheldon Adelson, millions and millions and millions of dollars to actually fund this movement, to fund multiple camp uh, organizations on campus, for example, Israel on Campus Coalition, uh, the Amcha Initiative, Stand With Us, the Simon Wazitol uh, Center, the uh, Anti-Defamation League, the uh, Zionist Organization of America, and so on and so forth. There are multiple organizations that are part of it, that constitute, and many of them sit on each other's boards. There is also other organizations that claim not to be focused particularly on this, but they are actually using that, such as Campus Watch, Middle East Forum, that was founded by the one of the leading Islamophobes in the country, Daniel Pipes, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. There is the uh, so-called David Horowitz Freedom uh, Center, which is uh, also, David Horowitz is also identified as a leading Islamophobe by Southern Poverty Law Center, who actually has published and has written advocate against Black Lives Matter, against sanctuary, against immigrant rights, and so on and so forth. So what Omar is saying about the whole question of how the agenda of the Zionist movement is now almost, almost, almost coincidental and sort of kind of falls and parallels, the right wing, other guys against climate, uh, environmental uh, justice, against women's rights, against workers' rights, against uh, the right to protest, against freedom of, of just all sorts of rights and so on. They are very much part of it. Now, it's really also really important for us to keep in mind that this is, this is none of the things that's happening against us to silence us, this, the new McCarthyism that is being implemented against us to silence, intimidate, smear, engage in character assassination, uh, send death threats, uh, um, by everything to us, to all of these things against us. None of this is accidental. None of it is random. None of it is isolated. I.e., it's not a little cottage industry that a couple of people are doing here and there. If anything, actually, the movement to support Palestinian rights, justice in for Palestine, such as the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, is the grassroots movement. It's the grassroots movement. And one of the, 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 the challenges for us now is how do we shift the balance of powers 
because at this point on a, on a grassroots level around the world not only in the us there is more and more support extending for palestine on a, on a, on a official level there is much more tightening and part of the reason of tightening and this extreme uh, oppression extreme harassment extreme because the supporters of israel the apologists of israel are frantic they are desperate they are having a very hard time convincing people that what israel is doing is okay this is why they resort to try to smear people say that if you are supporting justice in for palestine you are anti-semitic because it's a very easy catchphrase because everybody everybody agrees that there has to be a struggle against anti-semitism like there has to be a struggle against islamophobia anti-blackness against settler colonialism for women's rights for gender and sexual justice and so on and so forth everybody agrees on that nobody would 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 co uh, contest the universality of justice nobody everybody would agree with that so one of the things in order to actually smear an attack is to label people as either anti-semitic or terrorist supporters and this has been maybe no uh, evident uh, very much in the academy and why the academy why college campuses because as uh, I think it was the National Urban that said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. This is where people think, this is where people criticize. It's not the only place, but this is a very important site. And so there is a very strong attack by the people who are white supremacists, by the racists, by the, by the Zionists, by the people who want to shut us up, to stop the stuff in the academy, to threaten academics, to repress thought. This is really about repression of thought and thinking and developing critical thinking. And this has been going on. This is not something that is new to Palestine. What is, what is going on is that the Zionist movement is trying to create an exception for free speech of Palestine instead of actually saying this is free speech for all. And so they have failed. So they continue this. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples from our own experience. So on, April, on, on, on September 23rd, we do uh, in the Ahmed Studies Program, Arab and Muslim, if this is and Diaspora Studies Program at San Francisco State, it's an academic program that has been attacked and targeted. And one of the times that it's actually been targeted was when the students hosted Omar Barghouti to come give a lecture about human rights right after the 2008-2009 Israeli attack on Gaza. This was immediately after that. So Omar was going to speak about that and speak about BDS and so on. So one of the things that we were punished uh, uh, as a result was uh, the university president canceled our faculty searches for two faculty programs in order to build the program that I was hired by San Francisco State to build. We continued. We said, OK, this is what you're doing. We contested it. We fought against it. And we continued to build the program. The more we tried to build the program, the more institutionalization effort, the more it has been attacked. So uh, the first thing was to kind of like when they heard that we are going to submit the proposal for the minor, uh, academic minor, there was an extreme attack that actually used the Edward Said mural, which we have at San Francisco State, as a way to say that Palestinians are actually want to engage, the Ahmed Studies program might want to engage in the glorification of the murder of Jews, because Edward Said talks about colonialism and so on and so forth. Of course, we spent a lot of time, almost a year, countering this, establishing that this was not the case. Then the, the, we, we submitted the proposal for the minor. Then the Amcha initiative took on the fight on its own and actually started uh, targeting me and my colleagues for going on academic and labor delegation to Palestine in order because we were trying to build an academic agreement with an Najah National University in Palestine to support the right of education under occupation, to support Palestinian right of education and talk about what the amazing things that Palestinian academics and scholars and teachers and so on are producing, and also to be able to defend the right of people to be able to study, not to for students not to be in prison at checkpoints, faculty administration not to be uh, arrested, professors not be thrown in jail, and so on and so forth. So there was a very big campaign by the Amcha Initiative to really stop the collaboration with Palestinian universities. And actually, they started at the time the Anti-Defamation League calling Palestinian universities terrorist universities. The campaign escalated, targeting me now, and I was on sabbatical, by saying that I am misusing university funds to propagate terrorism. Because during the delegation we went to Palestine, we met with 198 people, 198 people in Jordan and Palestine, 
two of which were Layla Khalid and Sheikh Raid Salah. And they latch on that in order to use the definition of terrorism in order to undermine us and discredit what we are doing. Now, after multiple audits by the university, I mean, I hadn't done anything wrong, and I was, so the, the travel claims are always audited anyway, multiple times. After multiple audits, including five-year audit of my travel to Palestine, that did not have a single question about the missing receipt or penny. It was all about why do you travel to Palestine? Why do you collaborate with Palestinian universities? And I said, for knowledge. We're scholars. Isn't that what we're supposed to be producing? We're supposed to be producing knowledge. I was the university found that I did not do anything wrong, and there is no base for the charges. However, these charges continued. The more we already, by the way, have an agreement with Najah National University that has been targeted by Campus Wash Middle East Forum on the basis that this is a terrorist university that I'm going to brainwash students by taking them to Palestine and collaborate and so on. This also has been defeated because actually there is no basis for it. And actually even the, the charges that the Lawfare Project and the Zionist movement had charged with me saying that I flunked at one point, they said I flunked Zionist uh, students. I said, just produce one student. And so they took it out of the, of the, of the lawsuit, but it continued. So the more we, we build the agreement with Anna Jahnan, they used it. And I know we're going to be talking about Islamophobia, but let me mention a very small example here that in order for uh, law, uh, the Campus Watch to attack the agreement with Al-Najah National University, they put pictures of Palestinian men at Al-Najah National University in order to build into the discourse, in the dominant discourse in the U.S., that Arab, Palestinian, Muslim men are bloodthirsty, terrorists, misogynists, and so on. It's very interesting because Al-Najah National University, student population is 65% women. And we've raised it multiple times again and again. But it is an inconvenient truth, like the other truths that we talk about, that it is very inconvenient for the Zionist, uh, um, uh, Zionist lobby to continue. Now, they also went after the Edward Said scholarship. We established a scholarship in the name of the very well scholar Edward Said. And they tried to undermine it until we actually uh, contacted the Said family and Said family said, this is what we support and so on. But also now the, the university is trying to take away the Edward Said scholarship. Edward Said course has been canceled. Palestine-based uh, courses have been canceled and so on. And this is part of the pressure that the Zionist lobby is imposing on the university. I'm going to mention a couple of more uh, examples. One is the, the lawsuit that the Lawfare Project has filed against me and the university, claiming that San Francisco State is a place that, hostel, that fosters hostility to Jews that host, uh, fosters anti-Semitism and so on. Now, it was a 77-page uh, lawsuit. They used um, all, a law firm of almost 1,000 lawyers. We had two movement lawyers, but we had the movement and justice on our side. And after a, a year and a half, 18 months, we were able to defeat the lawsuit when the federal judge, William Oreck III, who is a very respected federal judge, himself Jewish, by the way, issued a 41-page ruling in which he said, and he was referring uh, to me saying that just because she's anti-Zionist and support Palestinian resistance does not make her anti-Semitic. One of the most important things actually in the lawsuit that I think it's really important to mention is that we also had received support from many people. So we had 12 scholars in Jewish studies writing an amicus brief supporting what we were saying. We had uh, students actually from a group called Open Hillel Open Hillel is, is, a, is a Jewish student group that had challenged Hillel student organization because Hillel punishes and refuses to allow students who support BDS and who uh, criticize Israel from being members, which is kind of when we want to talk about freedom of speech, this is one example. And so Open Hillel also issued uh, uh, an amicus brief. Nonetheless, so we won. The judge dismissed with prejudice. Judge Oreck dismissed with prejudice. Now they continue to try to get through the window what they weren't able to accomplish through the door. So they pressured San Francisco State University in a lawsuit that none of us were who had standing, so we couldn't say anything. And they came to a settlement. And this has to do with the fact that while we have a very a lot of support on the grassroots movement, on a professional institutional level, administrative level, the administrations or universities are being privatized. With the university being privatized, this is where the Israeli lobby comes in. And when the, this is where the pressure comes in to actually impose silencing on us and support uh, 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 the Zionist agenda. 
Uh, one of the examples that I wanted to speak about is the whole the, the, the censor, censorship of an open classroom we were doing. This is one of the things we do. We also do open classroom. We open our classrooms to the community. This is part of the Teaching Palestine Pedagogical Practice and the Indivisibility of Justice Research pro Project, where we have people from the community come, interact with the students, pass on intergenerational knowledge, and have the students in, at, in at, interact with the elders and learn from people in the community on the basis that knowledge is not only in the borders of the university. Of course, private universities and public universities becoming privatized insist that only students in the classrooms are supposed to have a benefit of the classroom. So other people cannot. And we say, no, we want to do open classroom. So one of the things we organized was we have been organizing all these open classrooms throughout the summer and, the, um, um, and, and, and in the past as well. But since COVID, we can only do things online. So we decided that this is something that we can reach out the world online. Uh, so the Zionist groups have really tried to silence us. We had a, a, a panel uh, called Whose Narratives, Gender, Justice and Resistance. And uh, it was a conversation with, with the uh, long-time Palestinian uh, feminist icon, Leila Khaled, along with two Jewish anti-Zionist leaders, Roni Kasril of South Africa, who was a, an active member of the ANC, a minister in Nelson Mandela, and Laura Whitehorn, who is a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, co-founder of releasing uh, aged people in prison, a uh, feminist queer activist in her own right, and has spent 14 years in prison. We had Seiko Odinga, who had spent 33 years in prison in the US, who was part of the Black Bat Panther Party, had been part of Malcolm X uh, group until Malcolm X was assassinated, part of Black Liberation. And we had the director of the Institute for Women's Studies at Birzeit University, um, Rula Abu Dahho, to actually talk about what does it mean to have uh, women's studies, one of the oldest institutions in the region, not only in the Arab world, anywhere else to speak about that. That webinar was, sh was shut down based on pressure from the law fair against at, at Zoom, and Zoom basically shut down the webinar on the claim that this might constitute material support for terrorism. So I just want to take a minute and say that actually this has no basis. All legal scholars say that the webinar we were going to do has no basis in material support for terrorism, and that we have the right as educators to engage in all sorts of narratives. This is, doesn't ha mean that you are actually necessarily advocating violence or doing any kind of armed resistance. You are bringing narratives. Now, this was silence. Civil liberties groups, all civil liberties groups, and American Association of University Professors, even uh, multiple freedom organizations protested it. So now one of my colleagues at University of California decided to do the same event, but now it is focused on whose narratives, what freedom speech for Palestine. Ironically, this was Professor Sean Malloy of University of California at Merced, along with the faculty association. We were going, this initiated that to collaborate with us. It is supposed to be on Friday. We're still going on with it. But on October 12th, Facebook shut down the event. Facebook then and actually took down the Ahmed Studies Facebook page, complete history of our archival work, everything we have in there. Uh, Eventbrite took down the, 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 the site. Uh, Zoom said first that they want to pass the responsibility from them being arbiters on what the content of the classroom to the universities. So the University of California was actually working out to make it possible for us to have it. And then Zoom finally on Friday uh, pressured the university and on Monday actually decided to shut down the event itself. It's very ironic that an event that will speak about freedom of speech was shut down. Part of this has to do with what Omar was speaking about, the whole question of the frantic and desperate efforts by Israel's apologists to cover up what Israel is doing. It's very difficult to do that, but part of it is to intimidate, engage in character assassination, pressure, make it so costly for any of us to do any of our work. Part of it has to do with preventing the, the institutionalization of program and trying to undermine a program like Ahmed Studies, dismantle. Because in an interview with NPR, Brooke Goldstein, executive director of Lofair, who's actually also doing the same campaign again, which has no basis, said that, oh, uh, Leila Khaled can speak anywhere she wants. And actually, Leila Khaled spoke on a Zoom webinar a week later, but it cannot be part of a legitimate university program. So it is not about actually who speak and where they speak. It's about silencing the very idea of producing knowledge in about Palestine 
and connecting it to the indivisibility of justice. This has been an effort to silence the program itself in order to send the message to all academics, to all graduate students, do not dare, do not bother, as Alan started by speaking about the professor at Florida State, I believe, right? Uh, not being able to speak, this is intended to send the chilling effect in order to stop what we are trying to do, to educate, to teach, to engage, to, to, to critique about Palestine because the tide is turning and because more and more people are supporting Palestine. So this is a last futile attempt by the Israel lobby in order to silence us. We will not be silenced and we will continue to, pr to, to produce uh, knowledge for justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Hadi. That was uh, amazing, and and you really opened our eyes. And, and you're, you know, thank you for educating us on this form of silencing of Palestinian advocacy. I mean, this is the kind of erasure in academia that these anti-Semitism anti bills are trying to do. This is what they're there for. Um, if you are interested in supporting the work at Ahmed, please do visit the Facebook page in support of Dr. Abdul Hadi. Um, it's definitely necessary. So there are these bills in place that violate our constitutionally protected rights to free speech and protest. We know these bills attack the BDS movement and Palestine advocacy specifically, and whether it's by the push of Zionist lobbying. So the Zionist project, the lobbying project, is also a major funder of the Islamophobia industry. According to CARE's 2019 report, Hijacked by Hate, millions of dollars were spent Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Please excuse the technical difficulties. Um, but I think uh, our colleague Lara, inshallah, will be joining us again momentarily. Um, I think actually here she is with us. Lara, can you hear us? I apologize about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. As I was saying, um, according to Kira's 2019 report titled Hijacked by Hate, millions of dollars were spent by Zionist organizations and lobby groups to attack Islam and Muslims in media and policy, encouraging, if not leading, the political movement against Islam. Zionism and Islamophobia are intertwined, including by way of faith washing. Faith washing, as explained by the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, promotes the idea that the so-called conflict is rooted in centuries-old religious differences instead of a settler colonial project that continues to dispossess and oppress Palestinians. According to faith washing, Palestinians are meant to represent Muslims and Israelis are meant to represent Jews, and they only need interfaith dialogue to find their way to a solution. So I wanna open this topic, topic briefly to the panelists to hear your take on faith washing and Islamophobia. Uh, Dr. Abdel Hadi, would you care to go first and share your thoughts on this? I was going to uh, maybe have uh, ask Omar to speak because the BDS or campaign. Omar can speak, sure so, And then I can go after if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, yes, sure. The, the BDS movement, as far back as 2015, actually issued a statement uh, condemning this uh, so called faith washing, especially uh, some Zionist organizations' uh, uh, manipulation use of uh, some so-called Muslim uh, uh, leaders, I don't know who assigned them as leaders, uh, but some Muslim leadership initiative was established by uh, a Zionist organization that is uh, in bed with the Israeli government, with the Israeli military, uh, and they came on a visit to the occupied Palestinian territory, to visit Al-Haram al-Sharif, to visit occupied uh, East Jerusalem, and we condemned that visit as a, as a, as a, as a faith-washing visit as a use and abuse of uh, the Muslim faith to whitewash Israel's apartheid, settler colonialism, and, uh, uh, and occupation. In fact, in a statement issued by the BDS movement, we said that we called for a boycott of this Muslim leadership uh, initiative, the MLI, and we said the MLI is, quote, a textbook example of a seemingly innocent program that reeks of complicity 
with Israel's racist regime and of contempt for Palestinian rights. Whilst presenting itself as a rigorous academic program, the MLI makes cynical use of religion or faith washing to provide cover for Israel's racial supremacy used as justification for the ongoing ethnic cleansing of, of Palestinians. And in fact, what MLI and other similar groups are doing, uh, uh, as Lara said, uh, uh, they're conflating Judaism with Zionism, with Israel, as Alan as well uh, said. In a way, this is uh, not just so uh, uh, baseless, it can be argued that this is anti-Semitic as well. Putting all Jews in one monolithic basket as if they're all represented by Israel is quite an anti-Semitic statement. Uh, in fact, it reduces uh, the human diversity among Jewish communities and, and uh, ignores uh, many strands of thought among Jewish communities worldwide from sharply anti-Zionist to far-right Zionist and everything in between. Um, so, so, so trying to turn this into a religious issue, ignoring its colonial uh, uh, dimension, which is the only dimension that matters, that Israel is a settler colony, it's an apartheid state. Even Israel's leading human rights organization is saying Israel is an apartheid state. Our struggle to end settler colonialism, apartheid and occupation ha has absolutely nothing to do with the so-called faith of our colonizers. We couldn't care less if our colonizers were Muslim, Christian, uh, Buddhist, atheist, uh, Jewish or whatever. As long as their boot is on our neck, we will continue to resist until we defeat and uh, 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 undo this entire system of oppression. Faith has, has no role to play in deciding who the enemy is and who the friend is. Jewish Voice for Peace is one of the most strategic partners of the BDS movement uh, in the US. And there's a huge, wonderful, and real interfaith coalition being built among churches, uh, Muslim groups, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and other progressive Jewish uh, groups, all opposed to injustice. Uh, as Rabab said, the indivisibility of, of, uh, of justice is what unites us. It's, it's not, uh, we don't see any faith group as an enemy or a friend. W what unites us is, is whether we support justice or injustice, racism or liberty. Okay, so I can add a couple of uh, to what Omar has said already. I think also part of this uh, problem of these uh, quote unquote interfaith faith washing groups is that it substitutes talking for structural changes. And this is something that has taken place in many movements. If you think about the civil rights movement in the United States, if you think about the women's movement, if you think about the anti apartheid movement, and so on, structural problems require structural solutions. The way in order to hold Israel accountable is by holding Israel accountable like any other country. No, no less, no more, no exceptionalizing and so on. But what happens, what these groups do actually is they divert attention from what the issue at hand in and think that if they just sit together and break bread, if everybody gets to know each other's menu, and sometimes actually the menu is not really each other's menu because a lot of Palestinian cultural foods and fats and so on have been appropriate as colonialism does everywhere. This is not also exceptional to Israeli colonialism. If people do that, that actually takes attention. So what does, it diverts attention from the real structural issues that need to be changed from uh, talking about it and actually puts it in just another space where let's just sit and talk and see these and then it constructs the people who are engaged in, in, in faith washing and in this so quote unquote interfaith because it's not really interfaith and it's not all faiths it's just it's actually has one particular one particular goal to use muslims in particular it completely erases palestinian christians it completely erases palestinians who may be of other religious persuasion or no religion whatsoever it completely erases any other factors and makes it very unidimensional it's just about that. And then they say, we don't care about anything else except for this. And, and we say, how can you not care about justice? How do you, how can you not care about justice and injustice? The last point is that, and I think it's really important, Omar mentioned it in your, in your, in your presentation. I want to bring it up again here, is that it recruits members of our own community to service the project of colonialism. It actually recruits them to cover up, to give a camouflage, to give a legitimate cover for colonialism, for Israeli apartheid, for racism, for uh, for occupation, when those things need to be addressed and need to be discussed. So that's actually quite dangerous. And it, it also 
internalizes among our young people the sort of internalized colonialism instead of them standing uh, proud and thinking about what they what they need to do and so on they basically become basically covers a fig leaf to cover up occupation colonialism and apartheid when people really need to be speaking about them and demand structural changes such as the bds movement Thank you so much, Dr. Abdelhadi. Um, to learn more, and, and, and Omar and Alan, to learn more on this, you can check out uscpr.org backslash faithwashing. But before I do close out to our panelists, are there any final thoughts you'd like to share, even any resources on the topic that our audience can check out? Listen, listening to Dr. Abdelhadi and Omar Barghouti, reminds me of what I've learned in 50 years or so of civil rights lawyering, um, which is that everything that I have done that promises change is done in collaboration with uh, political and social movements. And it's incredibly inspiring to listen to both of you, uh, Rabab and Omar, uh, and to know that I'm, as, as a civil rights lawyer, uh, hoping to continue to work alongside both of you and uh, do whatever I can to help the Palestinians struggle for justice. I'll just add a couple of words. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't, I wouldn't be joking to say that uh, Alan and uh, people who are standing by us and actually supporting justice in uh, in in JVP and Center for Constitutional Rights, Palestine Legal, ACLU, and elsewhere. If this is this is we this is really important. This is a very important. You are using, you have you have um, a, a privileged uh, position, and you're using that in the struggle for justice. This is what this is what solidarity is all about. This is what it means for us to stand together. Because I'm I'm convinced that justice will prevail at the end. Justice will prevail. It can prevail when we all come together, when we join our struggles together, when we have each other's backs, when we support each other. This is, this is something very empowering and very supportive. And it would not, I would not have lasted. And my colleagues and my students and all the colleagues in the academy would not have been able to last had it not been for many people who are actually speaking day in and day out, speaking truth to power. And for people like Omar and people in the BDS movement and the millions of people on the ground in Palestine and elsewhere who are standing up for justice and refusing to be silenced. So I think it's really important to keep emphasizing that we will not be silenced. We will continue to speak up truth for to power and we will continue trying to change the world to another reality. Thank you. Um, I would just add very, a very brief note. Uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once said boycott at a basic level is withdrawing cooperation with an evil system. When you think about that, it, it calls upon all of us to fulfill our moral, profound moral obligation to do no harm, to end complicity. And that's exactly what we're calling for in the United States in particular, to end military funding. That's not much to ask. Uh, uh, all Israel's crimes have made in the USA written all over them. So we're asking US citizens at a time when there's a huge movement led by indigenous, black and other people of color, uh, uh, justice movements uh, to, to realign the US budget from military spending and, and, and supporting the 0.01% of, 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 of the big fat rich Americans to the absolute majority of Americans with more health care, uh, jobs, uh, social expenditure, infrastructure, uh, climate justice, and so on. Also, it is time to realign U.S. foreign policy from the military basis and supporting uh, dictatorships, death squads, and, and, and uh, uh, brutal apartheid regimes like Israel to uh, a more peaceful international coexistence based on justice and human rights and international law. So the, the two agendas are very tied together. 
Thank you so much. And, and Alan, I just want to add that it's actually inspiring to learn from you all. You, you've all paved the path for growing activists and attorneys such as myself. So thank you so much. Thank you to our wonderful guests for educating us on this very important cause. Thank you to our audience for joining us as well. Please remember that next week we have our third episode, Flying Over Water, with our Southwest Florida Regional Coordinator, Ahmed Khan. So be sure to tune in. And I'll leave you with these Brief reminders, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught us, speak the truth even when it's bitter. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, we all know this verse by now, oh, you have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice. So we have these commandments by Allah, and we have these rights in the Constitution of America, so don't let them quash your speech, don't let them discourage you from seeking justice. Remember that, and may Allah bring out the truth and justice for all. Jazakallah khairan, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.